Hey, it's Mazzy. I'm here with uh, Jill Selvin, a rock critic writer. Uh, we've crossed paths for 40 plus years. He was for, uh, what, 37 years, the music rock critic of the uh, San Francisco Chronicle. So I grew up reading all your stories, you and Phil Elwood and Wasserman and obviously Ralph Joe Gleason on all the local papers. And but you'll want to have a, a little cross path somewhat because we both grew up in a Bay Area at the perfect time, the right time, right place, at least uh, musically, one of the great centers of music. But today we're here to talk about Drums and Demons, a tragic journey of uh, Jim Gordon. I'm going to let in a minute uh, Joel do sort of an introduction what this book is about. One of the greatest drummers, a tragic story of um, inner demons, mental health, uh, drug abuse, alcohol abuse. Uh, but I do want to do a shout out. There's going to be two links below, one kind of a fun link and one an important link. And because we're going to talk about the music of some of the, a lot of the records he was on, I think it's, I need to do a, uh, a shout out to people. There's an organization that my friend turned me on to called Backline and backline.care. There's a link below. It's mental health wellness resource for the music industry. It's a nonprofit and so any aspect of the music industry, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, they don't get a lot of support in healthcare in general, but mental health, as we know around the world, and especially in the States, not especially, but in the States right now is an important problem because that I'm doing that because that is a big part of this story and the, uh, of, um, of Joel, excuse me, of Jim Gordon here. But before we get into that, I just want to, I have a few books here. Jill Selvin also wrote, you know, two tragic uh, stories of, of joy and tragedy, Altamont. Uh, this is a concert I attended way in the back. I didn't even know there was a killing to the next day. Uh, he wrote this book on Altamont way back at some point, Summer of Love. He collaborated last year with this great book. Uh, I knew Chris Drockwitz and Down Home Music and Arhuli Records. Great photographs, great story of Chris that Joel worked on the last several years. We also lost Chris just in the last couple of years. And um, I think we both have a mutual friend, another tempestuous friend in Jim Marshall. And um, <laughs> since I've been a photo agent all these years, uh, I knew Jim extremely well. As well. And anybody knew Jim, he was like a pussycat, but he could be, he could, his bark was bigger than his bite. But his great photo archive, several books here. I know he did with Monterey Pop Festival. And two books I don't have here that I have read and I can't find them. One on the great producer songwriter, Burt Burns, and the other one on who I think was one of the most underrated rock stars of all time is Ricky Nelson. So that could be another story. I love Ricky Nelson. So welcome. That's the biggest introduction for a while. Wow, Norman, you know, uh, the check's in the mail. It's okay. It's okay. So I finished this book in, in about three days. Uh, I, I know a lot about him. I knew what he did. And I don't know if you want to get into that story as we progress. I knew maybe half of the great records he was on. But boy, as I said to Joel before, this is just a stack of records I picked. And this is even touching the surface of amazing albums and, and songs that uh, Jim Gordon played on. So why don't you do the intro, who he was, uh, what's so great about his drumming, and then, of course... Uh, you know, the demons in his head and what he went through. Well, Jim was uh, brought up in the San Fernando Valley in the 50s and uh, gravitated to the drums very early in life and took all the training and all the instruction. And by the time he was in high school, uh, he was all drums all the time he was the drum major of his high school team he was playing in a band uh he was doing sessions with uh publishers he was uh, just as as busy as he could be sitting in with the burbank symphony but the day after high school he went on the road with the everly brothers he was 17 years old and that's the beginning of his professional career it's kind of starting at the top uh Amazing he did the summer tour that young age. And then that September, he was in England with the Everleys. They were headlining a bill with uh, Little Richard, Bo Diddley, and a group out of London that had never been on the road before called the Rolling Stones. So Jim's career just covers this incredible expanse. His time in Hollywood as a session player 
had him playing on hit records by Sonny and Cher, by the Beach Boys, by Nancy Sinatra. <clears throat> Jim is the uh, shares the composite master track to uh, Good Vibrations with Hal Blaine. So he, he plays on. He's a to be the greatest pop record ever. Right, he's the percussionist on some of the songs on that album, right? On percussion, but he's on the kit on he, Good Vibrations. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, and he's on the the second verse, the bridge, and the outro, and the rest is Hal Blaine. But uh, in '69, he uh, left the studio to uh, get into the live rock scene. It was what was happening. He'd spent what uh, six years doing three sessions a day, six days a week, three, five songs a, a session. He'd become absolutely, completely proficient at the science of making hit records. But in 1969, the rock scene had changed and the focus had moved from hit records uh, to the FM radio and to the concert stage. That was the fall that Led Zeppelin had a big tour. They did a two and a half hour show with a half hour drum solo. The Who were out there with Duke Tommy and the Rolling Stones were back on stage with a very big tour. And that's when Jim sort of moved out of the studios, uh, starting with Delaney and Bonnie and Friends, then uh, into Mad Dogs and Englishmen, which then morphed into Derek and the Dominoes, where he ended up playing on the George Harrison solo album. And then after that fell apart, he was in traffic for a year. Uh, there's a fantastic live album with traffic. Welcome to the canteen. And then he went back. I'm to trying Hollywood. to keep up with you, Joel. I'm trying to keep. I up. see how I am. Went back to Hollywood where he re re returned to the sessions. And I mean, right away, he was cutting hit records. I am woman with Helen Reddy. Uh, Rock and pneumonia uh, with Johnny Rivers. It's Steely Dan. Uh, Carly Simon. You're so vain. Maria Moldauer. Uh, Midnight at the Oasis, Gordon Nightfoot, Sundown. That great, that great intro, that great intro on Ricky Don't Lose That Number, it's him, you know, playing. Oh, and, and the unbelievable uh, drum pattern on Pretzel Logic itself. I mean, the, it, he, he, he was picked for Steely Dan. In fact, it was Jeff Picaro who suggested him. Jeff Picaro went to the same high school that Jim did. Jeff Picaro's entire career is a tribute to Jim Gordon. Yeah, he's on Tom Waits. I mean, uh, the he's on John Denver. He's on Merle Haggard. He's on Gary Puckett. He's, you know, I mean, there wasn't anything he couldn't play. There was a short, and, -lived, obviously, the short-lived band where he's right, you know, there on the end there, on the uh, right here. And this band kind of crashed and burned, supposedly a, a David Geffen super group like CSN that did one album. Just unfortunately, you know, John De Souther, Souther. Uh, Chris Hillman and uh, Richie Fure from the Buffalo Springfield, but it just kind of didn't go anywhere, you know, unfortunately. Well, that's, of course, where a lot of Jim's uh, internal problems began to surface when he was out on the road with Souther, Hillman, and Fure. Jim was a schizophrenic. He was undiagnosed as such for many, many years, but uh, he struggled with a very severe case of, of, of mental illness. And uh, as it progressed, it undermined this incredible musical career and got to the point where he couldn't play music at all. One more I just wanted to show because the power... Oh, that one is so fantastic. Yeah. He, he just it, It's like a constant drum roll all the way through the track. Right, right. You know, you got to talk about... I mean, I've had people, a couple of people reach out to me because I've been reading this book and mentioning it to people and they talk about, you know... This guy also abused women, girlfriends, obviously, Rita Coolidge and things like that. And and we're not, uh, you know, shoving that away. There was and why were all these people, for instance, on the uh, the Mad Dogs and English tour when he when he beat up Rita Coolidge was were they enablers? They didn't really push him out. Why wasn't he pushed out? Care. It really, and it, it 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 didn't register with them. The uh, authentic psychotic behavior didn't stand out in that crowd. Uh, they were all drunk and, and high and, and on drugs and, and uh, engaged in all kinds of uh, sexual shenanigans. I mean, it just didn't stand out. But they weren't, the, these episodes with Jim 
and women. They they weren't like an Ike Turner kind of thing where he's using violence to try and control a female in a relationship. They were inexplicable outbursts, just eruptions that happened that were surprising to Jim, no doubt, as they were to the victims. Uh, and sometimes he didn't even know about it. Like, you know, an hour later or the next morning, he blank, he would blank out sometimes. He'd blank out about it. And, and schizophrenics have no ability to bond with other people. It's it 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 just it is. I mean, Jim felt guilty his whole life about his inability to form a really a relationship with his daughter. Yeah, uh, all his, his relationships with women were fraught. Uh, whether it was his 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 first wife or his second wife or the the women he lived with at times, but the daughter. I mean, he could never really establish any kind of father paternal bond with her and well, and and they didn't know he was schizophrenic they just knew he was remote and uh definite and quiet but uh, early on he didn't really reach out and he kind of didn't talk to anyone about it i think was it i know if it was his friend mike post one of his friends or there were, i forgot who it was in the book there was like it was seemed like the first person he actually opened up and talked to about it um who was that um like well, Larry Rolando, uh, that happens much later. Okay. Uh, he'd already opened up to psychiatrists by then. He didn't even talk to psychiatrists about it. He saw many, many, many psychiatrists and didn't tell them the full degree of his symptoms. The voices. Uh, especially the voices in his head. And and he finally, uh, he saw a psychiatrist that he felt really good about their appointment, and he went to get something to eat. And the voices wouldn't allow him to eat. He got on a pay phone on Ventura Boulevard and called this guy back, what, after an hour after leaving his office and, and said, I, I'm just, my head's full of these voices. They won't let me eat. I got to go somewhere where at least I can get something to eat. And this guy, this psychiatrist said, you come back right now. Checked him in to residential treatment. Jim stayed for a couple of months. Uh, they took him off drugs and alcohol, and and those were his most effective buffer against the voices. So really, he he experienced no benefit from this residential treatment. And after a couple of months, he checked himself out against medical advice, went home, and tried to kill himself with sleeping pills. Right. And that and was just sort of the beginning of him admitting that to somebody else that these problems existed for him. He well, felt ashamed of it. He felt. Uh, that he was an intelligent person who should be able to solve these problems. And he did everything he could to disguise them, to hide them, to keep them away from people knowing. Now, people spoke about Jim having this really easy, affable smile and this sort of compliant, genial nature. That was all a mask. That was how he presented to the world. Yeah. there. I mean... Within the whole book, there's a, there's a repeating thing about how he, you heard these voices in his head and he could drown them out ironically uh, with, you know, I mean, heroin and, and cocaine and other drugs and alcohol. And that his drumming was that one thing that kept it out. And he could, he could be messed up at, at either emotionally or uh, uh, mentally. And he could come into a session and literally right at the get go start something and almost like be almost like a one take drummer. He could do anything. And all these producers, you talk about, there's a great story of the Carly Simon song, You're So Vain. And, um, you know, he is not on the entire record. But then um, that is that that's um, uh, what's the producer who produced that? That's um, Richard Perry. Oh, Richard Perry. Right. Who brings him in and, and says, you know, the guy is Jim Keltner for that song. I'm mean, excuse me, uh, Jim Gordon for that song brings him in and virtually the first take. He does that song, what what he had in his mind, what the producer Richard Perry wanted for You're So Vain. And it's not that a lot of these records are not complicated, flashy, like Tony Williams drumming or jazz drumming, Art Blakey. Some of them are, but some of them are just so tight, like things like uh, Lonesome Fugitive, that kind of country snare thing uh, of Merle Haggard, which I adore. And then one of the records that I started playing more just because you brought it up and I probably won't even find it here now, but it's, oh, this record in 1968, that it's one of his favorites, you know? And in a way, this is the crossover for her, you know, being a folk singer and that beautiful angelic voice. And uh, the song here, 
I know it's who, who knows where the time goes. Uh, the uh, that great folk song by um, uh, Sandy Denny, but the song on here to me that was I think the first single "Someday Soon" because of Steve Stills when they hook up for the first time and suggest that song. That drumming on the song is just like Merle, on Merle Haggard records. Merle Haggard record, Simple, yeah. Quick. One little thing that probably the audience here, unless they're from the Bay Area, won't, might not realize or know. That song is very special too, good and bad. That we have a ra we had a radio station, KMPX in K San Francisco, premier underground FM rock station. The day in the what in the eighties when it went country, the first song they played was "Someday Soon." Sad because it became a country station after all those years. But the, I remember listening to it because he wanted to know what was going to happen when they turned the clock at noon or whatever time, and they played that song. But it's such a simple drum thing it's not flashy at all so jim's gift was to see the drums as a holy musical instrument and instead of just being a guy that kept time and held down the backbeat jim drove his drums into the fabric of the musical composition and that's the thing that everybody who worked with him said is that, that he had this musical sense as a drummer that completed the composition that didn't that he was a collaborator he was somebody who, who found his way into other people's music and illuminated it uh the van dyke park used the word luminous he well, said that jim, like, jim's like record, drumming was always I realized, luminous. I, i've had this record for years and of course classical gas was a big thing and i played it again after reading the book and again, I'm, there's going to be also in the link, a link of this playlist that Joel put together on Spotify, because it's a fantastic playlist of all these great songs that Jim Marshall, oops, God, Jim, all too many Jims here, yeah, uh, that Jim Gordon was on. And the drumming on Classical Gas, that novelty in a way song that was a huge hit. Um, but the rest of this record is like a sunshine pop record, a lot of quirkiness in it. But it's actually some cool stuff. And I realize I don't think I ever heard listened to this record beyond classical gas, probably over the years. But his rec his playing, there was one story, maybe you can remind us in the book. Uh, there was some musician that I wasn't familiar with. And when she was listening to the uh the band play, she realized it's the first time instead of the piano leading everything, it was Jim's drumming that kind of led the band, which that is not Renee really Armand. Good. Who is that? Renee Armand. Not familiar with her. No, she had a album out on uh, uh, A and M uh, that Jim co-produced, and uh, ended up uh, marrying Jim. Oh, uh, they, they, that marriage lasted for about six months. Uh, Renee's had a career that's lasted, you know, all you know, 40, 50 years. She started out with John Handy in San Francisco, and she was in the John Denver band for a long time. And she's made records off and on over the years. But the Rain Book, which is the thing that she did with Jim at AM Records, was a, a, a pretty big creative explosion for Jim. And plays guitar on it and keyboards and produced it. I listened, um, obviously, I think we, we can't talk about this story with uh, talking about, I mean, Derek and the Dominoes and this whole relationship of Bobby Whitlock and Eric Clapton and Carl Radel. I realize I've been saying rattle for years, but it's Radel. Um, uh, the amazing live drumming on this. I played this and I was, God, gobsmacked on that as well. But also the piano outro so talk about the piano outro and the controversy on the, on that of layla so they uh cut layla in miami during the first sessions and then came back a month later and clapton wasn't really happy with the track and he uh asked jim about this piano piece that he had heard jim and rita play at olympic studios sometime before uh and Rita had given him a tape of it. She had lyrics that went with it. Uh, it was a piece that the two of them had composed in Hollywood when they were living together. And Clapton had Jim play it, had Whitlock play a version of it. The producer, Tom Dowd, made a composite, and they stuck it on the end of Layla. Now, when the record came out in the United States, uh, the single did not have the piano exit, as Tom Dowd called it. Uh, it just had the the first three minutes, uh, and it, it stiffed. It, it 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 stalled about halfway up the charts. So about a year and a half later, 
the record company put out another version of Layla, this time with the piano exit. And that thing blew up to the top 10, uh, opened up the album and established Derek and the Dominoes as a, a, a an act, although they'd been broken up for maybe almost two years by that time yeah uh and clapton was you know home alone in 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 the depths of heroin addiction and and all that and um rita just heard it on the radio out of the corner of her ear and went whoa that's my song tried to contact the clapton people about getting credited just was shunned and sent home you know, without her lunch. Uh, and this had happened to her before when she and Bonnie Bramlett wrote Groupie Superstar, which she sang every night in the Mad Dogs tour uh, on stage. Uh, but it was recorded and credited to Leon Russell and Delaney Bramlett. So here's this whole thing's happening to her again. What I said in the book was that the music business was a pirate ship. And she was nothing but a wench. Wow. Wow. So, so I mean, obviously, there's a whole anti-women component here. But it wasn't like, uh, you know, these artists were intentionally. I mean, I'm not going to make an excuse different times and everything. But these guys were leading the bands and 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 taking from these great women uh, artists and not really giving them credit due in a lot of ways. And obviously, uh, the abuse situation, too. I can't believe, and this is just me editorializing it, after all these years, Clapton didn't step up and give... Uh, Rita Coolidge, some kind of a do, because especially later, you know, he does a song on the unplug thing. And uh, I'm sure Jim Gordon got royalties from that while he was in prison. Made him the wealthiest prisoner in the California Penal Authority. Yeah. He didn't have to have a job in prison. You know, he could, he had all the commissary money he needed. We, I should mention, uh, we're recording this in uh, what, end of February of uh, 2024, depending on when you watch this. Uh, about a little over a year ago, Jim Gordon died in Vacaville, same uh, place where uh, Charles Manson was for many decades as well, um, because of the tragedy. Spectre too. Oh, Spectre's there too. Or was there? Spectre too? died there God. too. God, what a what a jam session that would have been. Um, but it, and, and we're not making light of it. I'm not making light of it. But the, the situation is that um, if you don't know, because some people don't know the story, um, so maybe. I don't know, as tactfully as you can, because he was trying to get help all these years and he had a downfall. So uh, we we like to talk about and celebrate the music, but we need to talk about obviously the mental illness. And he tried to get help. And actually for someone who had money, he you know he had money for years on and off, had houses, they got rid of them. He lived in apartments and you know he had a really a downturn in the late seventies into the eighties. So talk about that leading to the, you know, the climax, I guess. Well, Jim's head was filled with voices, which are auditory hallucinations that are the most common uh, symptom of schizophrenia. And schizophrenia is unbelievably common. This came as a total shock to me to learn that schizophrenia exists in one in 100 in the general population. By comparison, multiple sclerosis is one in 10,000. So this, all those people that are sleeping under freeway overpasses, they have voices in their head. Uh, they're schizophrenic. Uh, it slowly took over Jim's life. These voices were commanding him. They didn't like him playing music. They didn't like the drums. And chief among the voices was the voice of his mother. And Osa Gordon was a nurse. She was a very sweet gal. Uh, she was maybe a little controlling. Her husband, who uh, was deceased by that point, had been an alcoholic. And that's sort of like common to alcoholic families is, you know, behind the scenes controlling. But she was a decent gal and she loved her, her, her sons. Uh, the voice in Jim's head did not correspond to who Osa was. The voice in his head was very mean, very critical uh and and would stop him from eating stop him from sleeping uh psychiatric care did not really help it took years for him to admit that the voices were of his own creation 
not that that changed anything. Uh, the psychiatric drugs were useless. The recovery community at that time knew very little about what they now call dual diagnosis, which is the combination of organic mental illness and addiction. Uh, those two things will braid together in a really poisonous, dangerous way. And at this stage, they've studied it and had enough experience to understand a little more about it. Back in 1975, it wasn't even a thing. And and they were treating Jim with these sledgehammer drugs, you know, Haldol and these violent antipsychotics and, you know, powerful tranquilizers. And of course, he was self-medicating because the alcohol and cocaine, that was the most useful uh, treatment he could find. But all this like degenerated his entire life. And there came a point where he could no longer play music. And it was rather dramatic. Uh, Bob Dylan called and asked him to go on the road with him and the voices wouldn't let him. What period and, was this? Do you, do you know? 1978. It was the, um, the, the, the gospel, the, the gospel tour. Oh, the G starting with the Jesus, a slow train, uh, and slow train uh, coming, and uh, the, his and, mother hung up on Dylan. And Tim Tim Drummond play on that tour? Is that no? Eventually, yeah. it was Keltner. Oh, Keltner, right? Okay, yeah, Keltner. They were uh, tight. They were tight. Those two. Okay. Oh, uh, Keltner loved Jim Gordon right. and 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 aspired to 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 the playing of Jim Gordon. And yeah, no, that was a a a a, 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 a soulful brothership. Uh, but um, so, uh, yeah, uh, he turned Dylan down and he called Paul Anka because he was furious at turning Dylan down and took a job to play with Paul Anka in Las Vegas, went out to the gig, set up his gear, got in the rehearsal, hit the drums once, and the voices told him they would kill him if he played anymore. Wow. So he told the music director he had a psychological problems and couldn't play, and he went home. And that was pretty much Jim's last gig. Wow. So that was 1978. Uh, for the next five years, he lived a horror, a hellscape of a life, uh, battling these incredibly powerful uh, um, voices that, that were a product of his mental illness, living by himself, having no friends, having no work. Uh it, it was just in and out of psychiatric hospitals, in and out of alcohol recovery programs, in and out of psychiatric offices, this job, then no job, then that job. It was just terrible. And nothing was getting better. All got worse. It culminated with him deciding to kill his mother. Again, he wasn't really murdering his mother as much as he was silencing her voice. But yeah, there was a very brutal murder. It was not deeply contemplated. Uh, it came up and he did it the next day. Uh, he beat her with a hammer, thinking that he would knock her unconscious and she wouldn't feel any pain, and then stabbed her with a kitchen knife right through her heart, stabbed her three or four times, and the last time the knife stuck in the floor. And then he went and sat around a bar with a bunch of friends and 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 drank until it closed. I talked to uh, somebody that ran into him at the bar that night who didn't understand why it, uh, the cuffs of his khakis were all muddy. And of course, it wasn't mud. Oh, God. So Jim was arrested that night and went to jail and spent the rest of his life in jail, which was 39 years. He was 38 when he was arrested. So he spent oh, one half his life. life. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I, I certainly don't want to end on that note. And again, uh, in the in the details there, there is a, a link to backline care. But I do want to go the next part of this. And I think since you have a stack of record stuff, again, as I said, there's a link to the Spotify playlist. And I listened to the whole thing over the weekend. And it was such a joy because, I mean, there, most of the songs I knew, there was a couple, uh, you know, and things like The Beat Goes On and... Uh, just great records. Harry Nielsen's Coconut and Jump in the Fire. That that's an intense song there. So talk a little Those bit. No symbols on that drum solo. Yeah, yeah, and that goes on forever for Nielsen. Yeah, and it's a four. It's a four piece drum set. No symbols. Just three to four minutes of drum solo off wow. those four drums. 
Uh, well, you you have some records. I don't know if you want to pull the record. Or just talk about certain songs that you like. Just let's just go through and name some songs, or I can you know pull some things out about that. Well, I love I love a lot of these things, and and I've come to see like Jim uh, illuminating the whatever it is that he's on. Uh, it, it's it's super special. The title track of of Low Spark has some of the most amazing drumming in any rock track, if it is a rock track. Uh, but I, I, I like some of the hit records really a lot. Uh, he just explodes on Grazing in the Grass by the Friends of Distinction. He absolutely makes My Maria by B.W. Stevenson just come alive, just jump out right from the start. And, and not just the, the, the kit drumming that he does on that, but he uses a very mysterious percussion instrument that is um, of his own devising. It's a tin can filled with rice that he welded shut. So it's like a very short rain stick. Wow. And that's on, on B.W. Stevenson. Uh, I love what he did with my uh, uh, Midnight at the Oasis. I, I mean, it's not Pretty spectacular moment. drumming, but what it is, is it tied everything together and, and gave the record its voice. You know, the it, one... It, the, the one band, the one record, I have no none of their records or his records, their records, that makes me want to go buy them. I'm sure they're in the dollar bins. But I now I want to get, because of your book, uh, Gary Puckett in the Union Gap. Is that Woman? Yeah. What's the song? Woman, Woman. But I mean, the, the, the those were 26-piece session calls. They were just huge, big band rock and roll. And the album tracks uh, on Gary Puckett records are, are just, just enormous. Uh, Jerry Fuller was the producer. He comes out of sort of the of the Ricky Nelson uh, uh, school of of music, and and uh, uh, Lies by the Knickerbockers was his record. But he he just brought everybody in, and there's only one person that could play drums that loud. Wow, wow! And this is one one of my top three favorite bands have always been the Birds, and I I know this all their albums back and backwards and forwards. I had no idea that he sat in and played instead of some of the uh, Michael Clark parts, like on Going Back, I think, is one Going of them. Going Back, man. I mean, that 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 drum flourish into the final chorus is a thing of beauty. I, they fired Michael Clark in the middle of the sessions. and They uh, fired everybody. <laughs> David. Well, there there's a, uh, uh, a recording of the fight in the studio, and somebody says, why don't we just bring in Hal Blaine? And the next week, the birds are back in the studio and Jim Gordon's on the session. <laughs> wow, wow. And this, I didn't know he plays on expecting to fly, you know, I mean, that's what? the original Neil Young solo session. Jack Nietzsche wanted to produce this song and Neil was out of the Buffalo Springfield at the moment. So Nietzsche conducted the session and it's all, uh, you know, studio musicians like Carol Kay and Tommy Tedesco and, and Don Randy and Jim on drums. One of the greatest songs that I love that he's on. And I guess, I, you know, this is the thing about after reading your book and in, in, in and out between reading it, I, I didn't realize how many great songs he was on. I just didn't. And I know he was a great drummer. I think uh, it, my friend, I think we have a friend that you might have remembered, my late friend who died a couple of years ago too, Coleman Burke from Pride and Joy. You know, uh, we met in 73 working at a record store and we were friend, life law friends and he died like in the middle there uh, from a, a aneurysm, a brain, well, brain tumor. But he used to always say Jim uh, Gordon had the best groove, the best drive in rock and roll. He could lead a band. He had timing. And then remember, this is before click tracks. Now every freaking drummer and band has a click track, you know, earpiece in your ear. He was the click track in a way, right? But... Only you know and I know that shuffle drum thing he goes, those paradiddles, whatever it is, I friggin' love that. Here, and of course, Delaney and Bonnie had a, a nice the version. Delaney and Bonnie version is so phenomenal. It's, it's not as well known as the Dave Mason version, but he recorded that about a month before the Dave Mason version. Right, and they do I, it I, the, the, not, not the live version. Oh, on their there, record. Uh, th there's a, a studio version. I have it. This Jim uh, is first studio sessions with Delaney and Bonnie. It's on a, an Atco single, Atco. and then it showed up on one of the Columbia albums. I think D&B Together. Yes, yeah. Yeah, right. but it's an unbelievable track. Leon's does his Jerry Lee Lewis thing on it. It's fantastic. Can you and imagine Jim, how, how tempestuous that must have been? Because uh, we've all heard or read or learned that Delaney and Delaney Bramlett uh, was a fucking bastard 
<laughs> to everybody, but a genius musician. But what talk about an asshole. In fact, there was a reissue I got of Motel Shot the last few years, and Jacques Holzman does a thing saying this guy is an asshole in the liner notes. You know, some because he, you know, they, I think then then Apple wanted to sign him. He was on Electra, and then they, you know, all that stuff. But um, now, okay, we're going about the music here, and of course, I said the great drumming on this as well. Um, and he played with um, George Harris, three of the Beatles. He didn't play with Paul McCartney, but he met McCartney early on. He plays with Lennon. He plays with Ringo. He plays with Harrison. Um, again, all these great things. And um, but but that whole th when you were doing this book, I know you know I, I read the the back end where you talk about you thank the people you worked with, and obviously people some people would talk. The Jim Keltners would talk. Uh, Sounds like his daughter spoke with you, uh, Jim Gordon's daughter. Eventually, eventually, yeah. Yeah, but I'm sure. Jim had to die for his daughter to like really uh, uh, want to come to terms with this. And that's true of his first wife and 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 his old friend, Mike Post. Uh, they, they were all, they were very respectful about my project, but they did not want to participate. Then when Jim died, everything changed. Uh, everything changed all over. But isn't it, that always it, the it case? Was, Once someone dies, that it, everyone opens up. It was just an instant transformation. He was no longer the guy who killed his mother. He was a sad victim of mental illness. Yeah, it, it just in in an instant, and and the, the things changed around uh, in in terms of people wanting to participate. Well, there in the are book a lot of lot. you know. Since I read the book too, I probably like you uh, went and watched all these interviews have been since on YouTube with drummers like Jim Keltner and all these drummers that now are talking about his work, not the bullshit, you know, that he went through. Um, and, and there is, there is a, you know, that balance of when we talk about, you know, Phil Spector made great records. The guy's a fucking asshole and did some horrible things, but he made some great friggin' records, you know, and, and when do you separate the artists from the stuff? And in his case, I don't know if, 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 if um, Phil Spector was crazy in the same way, I don't think he was crazy in the same way Jim uh, Gordon was in that type of thing. But I th I think it's an important story. But I assume, uh, in, in fact, conspicuous in his absence in your book is probably any comments or stories by uh, Eric Clapton. Well, Clapton is not interested in talking about this. And I, and I don't blame him. Uh, it, it was a terrible period of his life. And he has a lot to answer for, uh, especially around the Layla uh, credits. So, but Clapton's on the record about what he thinks of Jim. He loves uh, him. He loves his playing. Loved and uh, at the same time uh, detached. For instance, uh, he didn't mention Jim's name when he accepted the Grammy for Layla, did he? You know, I, I didn't even think about that, right? No, he didn't like uh, associate. But in his in his own autobiography, he says that the Jim Gordon was the greatest drummer he ever played with, and he's made other similar remarks. But he he's definitely distanced himself from it. Everybody did. They turned their backs on Jim in an instant, and and nobody looked back. Nobody asked. Nobody came to the court. Nobody visited him in jail, except the Osmond br drummer. The Jay Austin Austin. Brothers drummer. <laughs> I couldn't, when I read that, I had to like go back. Who the fuck went to see him? The Osmond Brothers drummer, one of the Osmond Brothers, is the only person that showed up for Jim Gordon. And I, I totally get it. You know, it's, it's kind of like you have friends and they divorce or something. You go with one couple or, or one person or the other. People, you know, take their path. Obviously, in this case, everyone leaves. Uh, well, look, Norman, the crime was so shocking and nobody had the backstory it just came out of the blue jim did what he killed his mother well but you... nobody knew about the 15 uh, uh residential treatment programs the thousands of hours with psychiatrists the, the years of taking drugs and trying to keep it between the gutters nobody knew about that first they knew about it he'd killed his mother you talk, there's, I see, I like the, the little stories interest me. I mean, talking about that, when you talk about um, the Grammy, I got to bring up, there's a story of Jim in prison and the Grammys are on television, I guess, and in the rec room or wherever. And I think Jim walks out at some point, doesn't want to watch the whole thing. And Eric Clapton wins for Layla and all, all the guys were saying, you know, you won and kind of had a weird, I don't know if he had a weird smile or what the deal was, but um yeah, you know, I mean, he probably made a shitload of money because of that unplugged record. 
Yeah, that's true. Uh, not not that you know uh, it, it improved his lifestyle, right, uh, right? And he was very disconnected from his past. Uh, while he was in prison, he really didn't want to look back. He didn't want to think back. He didn't want to uh, uh, dream on having all that glory and all those wonderful times. Uh, he wouldn't play drums. He, he wouldn't join prison bands. He'd sit in every so often. Well, that's but, the you know, only that you don't. You, I'll tell people, you don't talk about the prison years, really, except for that one story. That's not a part of this at all. I, it makes me curious, like, like, did he ever have visitors over the years? Did he ever get into music? Did he ever pay attention? That only story was that Layla story. I mean, it just, after four, you know half your life in music, and then all of a sudden it's gone. And, I mean, you have to deal with, and I'm sure he, he has a different kind of mental care. And, again, what do you think? And, again, you were not a therapist, a psychologist, a medical doctor, a head doctor. But in this day and age with the drugs we have now, could he have been helped in a better way now? No. No? Jim, uh, Jim's illness was as severe as that illness gets. And they don't really have any treatment for it. They they don't even know what causes it. Uh, it's a very mysterious ailment. And uh, Jim was, like I said, suffered from it as severely as she could you know um both mike post who uh started his music career with jim and uh was jim's daughter's godfather and his first wife jill told me after they read the book that they could stop feeling guilty that they realized that they couldn't have done anything to help jim that they had both gone through life feeling like they hadn't done enough. And having read the book, they came to understand that there wasn't anything that could have been done. Wow. And let me just, for people who don't know, Mike Post uh, became one of the biggest Hollywood uh, TV composers. He did Rockford File theme that Jim plays on, uh, Hill Street Blues, so many uh, t television themes that he composed and I guess arranged, orchestrated. Uh, big so there's a Mike Post album called Fused, which is Mike and a big band arranger trying to combine big band and rock and roll. And and Jim is particularly fantastic on that. And there's a track that you probably can dig up on YouTube. It's not on Spotify, called The Briarwood Express. The Jim is such a part of, he got a songwriting credit on it. But uh, it's 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 just phenomenal, and 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 Post was very uh, progressive uh, in, in his career. You know, classical gas was all his work. I mean, that was just a guitar number that uh, Mike Post blew into something really special. Yeah. Everyone, everyone now is going to go to Discogs and buy that Mike Post record, so it's going to sell out. Price is going to go up. That happens when I it, it might go up to two video. or three bucks. Yeah, uh, but, it, now, but everyone's going to want it. Collectible. You're yeah. going to raise the price, Joe. Everyone's going to want it. It's going to be a flood. Well, a Briarwood Express is a masterpiece. It'll be reissued on Record Store Day now, next year, probably. Someone's going to reissue it after hearing you talk about it. Um, any last words? I think we're going to wind down. Before we I go, I want uh, you to close out anything else you want to say about the book or Jim or the whole process or his music. But again, a couple of things. There's a great Spotify track list if you stream i'm not a streamer but i did stream it um backline is a mental health wellness resource for the music industry it's a non-profit so if you or you know anyone in the music uh they'll help you free they'll put you in touch i mean obviously as we spoke about here there's no magic pill i had to use that even as a term here uh to help in this thing but you should reach out if you have fucked up thoughts or heads you know things in your head so we do take this stuff very seriously um, any kind of abuse of women or anybody, you know, it's it's horrible. Uh, but we're talking about the art, too, of this thing. And, um, you know, this book that it comes out next week. Well, by the time this is up, you can definitely order it. It'll be out in the stores, I guess, next week. Uh, Tragic Journey of Jim Gordon, Drums and Demons. How, were you, you, you were working on this, you just said, before uh, he died. So what a what an interesting time period that again, you said people opened up. Once he died, there's other people that maybe said no the first time. 
there was that. Uh, certainly, uh, the the family opened up and 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 stepped in, and and that was that was really healing for them and incredibly important to the project. Okay. So, yeah, uh, the book is Norman, like you say, as much about mental illness as it is about music. And I'm I'm real fond of of, of all my books, some more than others, but. Th this book stands apart to me because it deals with something that is really important beyond the world of music because our society does not deal honestly or effectively with mental illness it, pretty much we just avert our eyes and turn our backs on it the mental health professionals that i spoke to about schizophrenia they all despair of the kind of treatment that these people are given uh, in our, uh, you know, dialed in on drugs, picked up off the street, dialed in on drugs, and then tossed back out. No tools to deal with life, no support systems, just, you know, uncaring, you know, uh, bureaucratic approach to, to human life. And Jim, Jim had as promising a life as anybody could have. Uh, Starting right at the day after high school, he was on a golden road uh, with family, with profession, with this incredible ability, with writing, surfing, this fantastic time in music. And he was wiped out by mental illness, just destroyed catastrophically. And if it can happen to Jim, and this is something that Frank Zappa says in the book, he says that if it's just chemicals in the brain, it could happen to anyone. Yeah. So in this book, I am able to show you, to illustrate in pretty graphic and wrenching detail just how disastrous mental illness can be. And that's important. Well, that's we can kind of end it right there. I mean, from from that great just syncopated thing with Merle Haggard, Lonesome Fugitive, and Judy Collins, to the complicatedness of Frank Zappa and Apostrophe album. I mean, not many drummers can do that on both ends of that. You know, I don't know many. I mean, they're not you know Bill Bruford, all that kind of uh, you know prog messed up stuff. It's amazing. So. Thanks, Joel. Uh, it's a good book. Oh, Links below to everything. And um, I'm going to end this now. Hang on for a minute. And uh, thanks for watching. And as I always say, Mazzy loves you. Uh, take care, everyone. Thank you.